You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Our friend Scott Merkin uh, tweeting out on Tuesday, Will Venable on Foul Territory TV stating that Walter McKibben is going to be the team's new bench coach. Now, he's interesting. He was the Brewers' run prevention coordinator doing game planning and was a catcher guru. Remember, we have a big catching prospect coming to the majors this year, and he is now the bench coach for the White Sox. And I love it because... It's outside the organization. It's a guy that Venable wanted, and it's a guy that sounds really qualified to do it. I want to find something wrong with them. Like, I have plenty of things to yell about on this show today. There are some things that just boggle the mind that we're going to get into. And it all comes from how Jerry Reinstorf runs the team. It's his penny-pinching and the way he runs the team that drives me insane. But when I look at what Chris Getz is doing, I keep going... Wow, look at this now. We got the manager everybody wanted to have, and he went out and got a guy that you're like, yeah, I'll take that guy. I don't even know who he is. I didn't know who Walter McKibben was until today. You you know so little about him, you're calling him Walter when his name is Walker. Unbelievable, his name is Walker, Ed. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that should give you an idea of, of where That's things are. That's how little are. I know about him. I'm calling him Walter, his name is Walker, and yeah, he's the new I, bench coach. I, and and, and it, it is, you're right, it is a good hire. Um, because you, you are looking at a guy who was working with Pat Murphy, who was a very good replacement for Craig Council up in Milwaukee. That was a huge amount of concern there last year, and the Brewers had a, had a fine season. And a guy that was working as a, a run prevention coordinator, a former pitcher, was doing game planning with Murphy. That's that's the type of guy that you sit there and go, okay, what are you looking for in a bench coach? Well, if you're... Pedro Grafol, you were using Charlie Montoya, a former manager who clearly you were sitting there going like, how do I do my job, right? This is a guy that's going to sit there and tell you, okay, you got to go give the lineup cards to the umpire, umpire. Yeah, there you go. Not empire, umpire with a, with a U, Pedro. Here, Will Venable, who's ready to be a manager, is sitting there going, all right, I need a guy who's going to help me plan. I need a game plan guy. I need a guy who, who can work with these young catchers I'm going to have because I saw what he did with Contreras. And I, this is what I want sitting on the bench next to me. This is my strategy guy. You're right, right about this. You're right about this. This is Wilson Contreras's guy. Like, look at what the Brewers have going on at the catching position. And this guy's considered to be a catcher guru. And we have yeah. Edgar Caro getting here. Like, I mean, the, yeah, this is almost like video game hiring at this point. The White Sox are going out. And they're adding guys that are respected around the league and get results. Brian Bannister wrote a book on pitching. He's the pitching guy. Ryan Fuller, the new hitting coach. Like around the league, people sit there and say, this guy knows what he's doing. It's not like one of those things. Remember when you talk about hitting coaches? And I've said it on the show before. Well, you probably need one guy to help you with power and one guy to hit you you know, talk about like slap hitting and you might as well have three, three hitting coaches in there, right? Because who really teaches these guys how to do stuff? But Ryan Fuller's one of those guys where people talk about the prowess he has in, in teaching a philosophy that actually makes a difference. And then you go bring in a guy to be your bench coach. And he's a run prevention coordinator. I didn't even know that existed. Like I'm sitting here right now just just kissing my own muscles at the bar. I'm so excited about the idea yeah, that there's it, such a, a thing as a putting. Please stop doing as that. As a run prevention coordinator. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm titillated by it. Well, and and what what do you suppose that means? Because what I read into that is, you know how we've long talked about the fact that the White Sox couldn't position their players if they if they wanted to, like it's it's happenstance if, right. a, if a White Sox defender is in the guy, right place. The last guy who knew how to move his players around was Ozzie Guillen, and he did it on instinct. Go back and watch the entire like postseason in 2005. It's all there. I have the entire box set of every game, and if you go back and you watch it, 
Ozzy's sitting there with his towel wrapped around his neck and he just stands up there and he moves guys. Watch the last sequence in 2008 in the blackout game. How he's trying to move Die over and he's moving Anderson over and the ball goes right there. Right. Like that was the last time somebody actually understood it. And it's because he had amazing instincts and he was probably paying attention to what was going on. And since then, I have never seen it. And and here's a guy who devotes what he does, like as a coach, to this kind of thing. And he's a catcher guru with Wilson Contreras as his latest catcher. Like, uh, give me all of this. I mean, I, right now, I know I'm clinging as a fan to hope. We lost 121 games. I'm just begging for something good to happen. So I just, I'm looking for good in everything. But you got me at this point. You know, I mean, every hire that they bring in makes me feel good. Everything that they do makes me feel good. I didn't even like the Austin Slater move. Like I tweeted it out on the Sox in the Basement account on Twitter. Put that Ryan Reynolds uh, gif where he sits there and he pulls the uh, but the why? surgeon mask off to the side and he goes, yeah, but and, why? and he's wondering, yeah. Austin Slater is 31 years old last year. This will be his year 32 season. He had a terrible seven, seven, year last year. Seven years in the majors right now, Seven right? years in the majors, 4.5 B-War, which makes him replacement level. Negative 0.2 in 2024. And I'm like, why do we need this guy? And then I dive into it a little bit. And I see this. I see a guy with an OPS plus, which means he's above average if he's over 100. Hundreds average. A 151 OPS plus in the shortened 2020 season. A 101 OPS plus, so league average in 2021. A 121 OPS plus in 22. And in 23, a little bit over average at 108. And then a terrible 2024. Terrible. He was on three different teams. He was on the Giants with an 81 OPS plus. He had a 575 OPS. And then he goes to Cincinnati and he has a 302 OPS, only over 21 at bats or something like that. So he was only there for like a yeah, couple of He was there for eight games last year in right. Cincinnati. Then he gets to Baltimore and he's back to league average. And I sit there and I think to myself, why would they, why would they sign this guy to a major league contract? And then you remember that Ryan Fuller was with the Orioles. This is a project. This is Ryan Fuller got to the organization. And somebody actually said, is there anybody you've had your eye on? And he goes, you should bring in Austin Slater because there's more for us to do. That's how I saw it. I might be looking at the world through rosy, rainbow-colored glasses. But that's what I see. I see a guy who had success, struggled, got to Baltimore, Ryan Fuller got him back to normal, and then he's sitting out there and nobody's thinking about him. Ryan Fuller gets hired as the hitting coordinator. And he's the first MLB contract handed out in this offseason. That's what I see. Yeah, well, and that's what we're looking for too, right? Is we're, we're looking to see when it comes to signing these veterans, what are you looking for in a veteran if you're Chris Gatz? And Slater, you know, some positional flexibility, plays the outfield decently. He's a first baseman. He's a potential DH. He's basically a, a a bench slash platoon guy for the Giants for all these years. And you're not excited about him because that was your knee-jerk reaction and one that I think most people would have is, why are you giving Austin Slater a major league deal? He's not, he's barely hanging on as a major league player. But if Ryan Fuller's sitting there going, you know, when I got my hands on him in Baltimore, I only had 33 games with the guy. And we were in the, you know, we're in the stretch that, of this pennant race and, and he's just a complimentary piece for us at that point. So I'm not really giving him a whole lot of time and at bats, but he's a guy that I can maybe turn into something. If you're Ryan Fuller, you're 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 telling Getz that I can turn him into something that you might be able to flip at the deadline. He gave them half a win above replacement in less than 80 plate appearances in Baltimore. In that small sample size in Baltimore with Fuller, that's what he gave them. And you know that in the first couple of games, Fuller's trying to get him back to what he was supposed to be. Again, man, I, I, you know, I'm fanboying out right now on the front office. I got to be honest with you. I, I am. 
I, I, I look at this and I go, you went and got a pitching guru last year. You went and got a hitting guru. You just went and got a guy who stops defensive or what, 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 what is that again? Run what does my guy Walker do again? Run prevention coordinator. Right, so you that went and is, got that guy, and he's a yeah. catcher guru that came from Wilson Contreras development. Yeah, and and that's that that is. I'm geeking out. I'm I'm sitting there saying like, look, it's got to get better than 121 losses, Ed. Like I'm sitting there going, they're doing something. It's better than what the last group used to do. The last people in charge used to tell you, well, you know what, we're just going to have Daryl Boston teach him some fundamentals. Because when I think fundamentals, I think Daryl Boston. Right. Him and his whistle are going to take care of everything. Yes. I mean, he's, he's taught people how to call their dog from across a park with right. that whistle. But, or, you know, or Pedro's going to come in and he's going to put up an acronym on the, on the uh, bulletin board. Socks in the Basement listeners, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, out of assisted living. Maybe you're getting older. You're trying to figure out how to get around the house. You're afraid that you might hurt yourself. You're living alone. It's all about getting around on your own. Living independently. Stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling, all at Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. They work with your insurance and have 0% financing for qualified individuals. And Hyatt also has the latest and greatest in CPAP machines. If you're unhappy with your vendor, switch now. Get supplies directly mailed to you. And if you're down on the south side, stop by the showroom. They have testing rooms and they'll show you all your options you probably don't even know about. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors and any medical equipment you can probably think of. See everything High at Home Medical Equipment has to offer at hhme.com. No, what's happening here is, like you said, a guy to instill a hitting philosophy across all levels following a year where you had a guy instill a pitching philosophy across all levels. And by the way, we saw how that worked because we started to see as the season wore on, both in the minors and in the majors, how the young pitching was coming along, right? And we can see progress from a lot of young pitchers. So the expectation is you're going to see that from hitters this year under Ryan Fuller because every level is going to teach the same way, the same thought process, the same approach. And when you see an Austin Slater come in, a guy that clearly benefited from Ryan Fuller's tutelage as the co-hitting you know, coach of the, of the Baltimore Royals last year, that's a guy that is going to come in and, and, if nothing else, one, be a guy that hopefully produces better than what you have on the roster currently, but two, also is potentially then a guy that if, if he sits there and he's bought into Fuller's philosophy and, and is like, yeah, I get this, that helps to have players that have already bought in come in as well because that that that's a veteran voice that can sit there and take a Colson Montgomery and say, look, one kid, I've been doing this for seven years. I've had some success in this league. Not a ton. You're better than I am, so you better hit better than I am. But this is what he means when he's talking about this, all right? This is what you got to do, and it helps to reinforce it. Because as a hitting coach, I mean, let's face it, you can't have, you know, the, the ear of, of 13 guys – 14 guys all the time, right? So you, you need some of that. So I think that's that's why Slater's in. And uh, there's a lot to be said about that. Now it's just the question of who is going to be on the field and, and can get, get that done because he's building, like you said, a great foundation. I can geek out with you about the foundation of this, but they've got to start delivering players that can deliver on the field too. Well, and and you, mentioned, you mentioned Colson Montgomery. And he got, he got his contract selected – along with uh, pitcher Juan Carrillo. Juan Carrillo. And that was done in advance of the Rule 5 draft that had to be entered into the 40-man roster. So now the 40-man roster is at 39. And what concerns me is we're only a couple days away from the tender deadline. If you wanted to add more guys that have 40-man roster, you would have released Sheets and Vaughn. And to see neither one of them released yet concerns me. Now, look, they may still be planning on non-tendering them. They may be planning on making one or two selections in the Rule 5 draft. They may want to have some flexibility if they trade Crochet for multiple prospects. You don't know what, the, what they're doing. But it frightens me that you're sitting at 39. As this episode comes out on the 20th, we're recording late night on the 19th sitting at the bar here in my basement on the south side of Chicago. And 
And I'm concerned that I haven't heard anything about what they're doing with Vaughn and Sheets. Because that that's going to be the first blunder of the offseason. That's going to be the first mistake. That's going to be the first thing that bothers me because you cannot justify $6 million for Andrew Vaughn. You can't. You can't justify $3.5 million for Gavin Sheets. These guys are replacement to below replacement level players. You don't need to spend that money on them. You should be saving that money and using it in free agency. And that goes back to the Slater thing. Like, if if Slater's going to be there as the fourth outfielder or a guy who moves into the infield and stands at first base, like, they're going to use him somewhere on the roster. Great. If the plan is he's going to eat up all the at-bats standing in right field, I have a problem with it. I don't believe that's what they're going to do, but my fear is we're not we're, we're actually not going to be at 90 million dollars as a payroll. We're going to be at 60. We we could be the worst payroll in baseball at 90, but we want to be extra worse. And and what they really need to do at this point is still be looking at the free agent pool that's out there, adding a few bats, and one of the easiest places to add is at first base, DH. You know, I mean, like, they're, they're, it's it's plentiful. Go find a hitter. Why are you going to put Andrew Vaughn back at first? Why are you going to keep Gavin Sheets on the team? I don't get it. I mean, if they kept one of them, Ed, if they kept one of them, I'd be disappointed, but I'd be like, okay, there's still room. You keep both of them, you're hampering the development of other players, and you're hurting your ability to pick up a free agent to sit at one of those positions, you could flip that guy at the trade deadline and get more prospects. It makes no sense. Well, and more to the point, not not just the prospects and and the young guys that, that Vaughn and Sheets could be stopping from from taking at bats, but you have an opportunity in the Rule Five draft to pull a hitting prospect, and the guys that tend to be you know, quickest to the majors in terms of their ability to hit are that first base DH type of guy, right? Because you can't really, re- well, you can rely on on some of the defense coming out of the minors, obviously, that that can be a way that a guy gets in. But a lot of times the the base running, the the defense, things like that, all have to come together, for example, for an outfielder, for a catcher. Uh, defense becomes really important. Middle infielders' defense becomes really important. Positioning and understanding situational baseball there's a lot that goes into it. When you're standing at first base, that tends to be the big lunkhead guys that can hit home runs. And it's not that they can't be smart about it, but you know, they're just the, the dudes that, that rake automatically that you don't know what else to do with. So you put them at the plate and you stand them at first and be like, just don't drop it when somebody throws it at your chest. Okay, buddy. And as a rule five draft, that's kind of what you're sitting here going like that's that's going to be something that you can work with a guy who's bat ready but doesn't have a position where they can be a dh a guy who's bat ready but is stuck at first base behind a bunch of first basemen in another organization a guy who is bat ready is going to be important to the 2025 white Sox versus a guy who is a good defensive outfielder but we're, we have questions about what he can do at the plate because with a rule five guy he's got to be on the team the entire year otherwise you have to offer him back or you've got to create a trade for him. And that's where the Rule 5 draft kind of falls apart as far as pulling a hitter, which is also why, you know, when you're talking about do the White Sox make a mistake, for example, by not keeping more prospects that are Rule 5 eligible on the 40-man roster and lynching Vaughn and and losing Gavin Sheets and, and maybe even like a Braden Shoemaker or something like, like that, some of that is just sitting there going, look, I don't know if these guys are ready, and I don't know if anyone's willing to be taking them on for the entire year because they're not ready. So th- this all plays in, and and I agree you're with saying, you. You're saying it's possible there really is anybody else that was worth protecting, that they don't need to make the decision yet. Because, I mean, Shoemake, that's that's a no-brainer, right? Right. You, you don't need him on the 40, around. man. Like that's that's a that's a weird thing to keep him around. You obviously don't value anybody else except for Montgomery in this picture. You're like Corella, Corella and Montgomery, that's it. You don't want anybody else. You don't think anybody else is somebody that somebody could come and get. If anybody gets pulled off the White Sox in the Rule Five draft, you almost have to look at Chris Getz and say, You screwed that up. 
because you you could have easily moved on from Shoemaker. Stocks in the Basement listeners trying to make the most of your money. Give a call to Tom Walsh, your Edward Jones Financial Advisor. Located on the corner of 111th and Kedzie, but serving the Chicagoland area, Tom has a get-to-know-you approach and a do-the-right-thing attitude. He's been doing this for decades. It's all about knowing your options when you're investing and planning for your retirement. No matter what stage you are at, it costs nothing to check in with Tom. Give Tom Walsh or Edward Jones Financial Advisor a call today, 773-779-0023. Edward Jones, member SIPC. The name that gets bandied about in the in the reports leading up to this is Wilford Varis, who is Fernando Tatis Jr.'s cousin. So we all know what happens when you lose a member of the Tatis family for nothing. That's it. That's it. It's uh, all over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And he's the number 25 prospect, but the knock on Varus is that he is powerful, but he has an ultra-aggressive approach that is not going to play well yet because he just does not have the ability to lay off the ball. Right, they might not care about him. I mean, think about this. Like, like, look at how Bannister just gave up on certain pitchers already. Right. So maybe this is something where, I mean, like, we sit there and say, oh, the White Sox like this guy. Well, they might not like this guy anymore. This is a new regime. And and Fuller might have come in and sat there and said, this is exactly the kind of prospect we're getting rid of because I can't I can't do anything with this. And this doesn't fit what we're going to be offensively as an organization. The other part of it is, is that they might like Varus, but then they sit there and go, oh, okay, I don't want him on the 40-man. I want that flexibility for the 40-man roster because I'm going to trade Crochet for like four or five guys, and I'm still going to sign some guys. And I don't want Veras stuck on my 40 man because I can't get rid of him once he's on there. I got to keep him on the 40 man. But no one is going to take this massive strikeout magnet and keep him on their bench all year and waste a spot on the major league roster for a guy who is very clearly not ready to be a major league baseball player because he just does not have a feel for what he needs to do at the plate and occasionally runs into one. That's not the type of guy that that someone's going to go out and and grab. And if they do, God bless them. They're probably giving him back to us midway through the season after he's maybe learned something else because there's no way that this guy is going to succeed right now. He's just that not ready. So th- those are the two things that go into play there. But, yeah, it could be either one, really. They could just be sitting there going, take him off our hands, go for it, good luck. Or they could be sitting there saying, you know, this is – strategically, I'm going to keep Braden Shoemake on the 40-man roster. I don't need to make a move with him right now. But I know the instant that somebody, the next guy that gets signed that is going to be on on the 40-man or the next couple of guys that come through, you know, Shoemake's on the chopping block and Vaughn's on the chopping block and Sheets is on the chopping block. There's there's probably some guys there. It would just be more comforting as a fan if we just sat there and said, okay, let the purge begin. Like, just drag them out in public, execute them by releasing them, not actually executing them. But get them out of the white socks. No, I, I want, I want actual, I want actual executions. You, you listen, want actual blood. Listen, listen. If I'm running this team, if I'm the general manager today, what's wrong with walking into the next stage of this off season with a 35 man roster and five open spots? What's wrong with having the ability to go and pick up multiple guys? in the Rule 5 draft because you can just give them back in a month. If you already know that Braden Shoemake is not part of your future, and he's not, why well, have him on your team? Like That's the thing to me. I, I, I never understood this. The Why not? What happens if you're in the draft? Let's be honest. What happens if you're in the draft and all of a sudden like you're sitting there in round two of the Rule 5 draft and you're like, man, I wish I could have taken another guy, but I can't. Like... I get it if you're if you're stacked. Like remember coming out of the supposed rebuild that we were in. Remember they had to protect so many guys. Oh yeah. Right? It was like, oh, we gotta we gotta add this guy. But remember, Mike Rodolfo, oh, we gotta protect him. He didn't turn anything, but we gotta protect him. All these guys are gonna be big. They don't have that. They don't have that kind of crunch. So to me, let go of a couple guys. Walk into the next stage at forty at thirty seven, 
36, 35 guys on your 40-man roster. These guys don't matter. The moment you know that they're never going to be a part of your major league roster, move on from them. There's, they're not cutthroat enough. I'm sorry. No, it's just like a thing that bothers me about sports. Yeah. If I were a general manager, I would never, never want to meet you on a personal level. I'd be a jerk. I want the manager to know you. I want the training staff to know you. I want all the coaches to know you. But I don't want to know you. I would go stand off to the side and never want to meet you. If you came up to me as a player and be like, Mr. Lanuti, thanks for signing me. I'd be like, all right, good luck, kid. I want to introduce you to my wife and my kids. No, that it, we're not at that oh, place. Absolutely not. We're not no, at that I, place. I don't want to meet the wife and kids. I don't care. I don't care about your mortgage. I don't care about where you got him in school. I don't care if you give the charitable organizations. Do you hit? Do you field? Can you strike out guys? That's my job. And I think we run into this problem here. There's no reason for some of these guys to be on the 40-man roster. And everybody will sit there and say, well, you know, they only needed to add two guys. So what's the big deal? And my thing is, if a guy like Shoemake has got no place on this team, I'd rather leave the open space in case something comes free and is available in the in the Rule 5 draft. And that's what disturbs me about how they do things. I don't get this. I don't think every team does this. If they do, they're all wrong. You know? <laughs> well, yeah. They are. They're all wrong. Yeah. I mean, like, what do you care about? If you're a GM, Ed, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. If you're a general manager, you should know who you think is good enough to be on this roster, who you think you have to hold on to because you can't afford to go get a replacement, who do you think has the potential to be part of it. And if you don't have any, if you're not in those categories, like I don't think you have a future, I don't think you're the present, and you're not a necessary evil, you're gone. Because maybe I get lucky with somebody else. I've already made a decision about you. This is the thing I don't get about how the White Sox do business. No, and I mean, look at somebody like the Oakland A's, right? Another team that that could just raid the Rule 5 draft. I mean, th- there's nothing special going on with the athletics that they couldn't l- lose a few guys I off mean, their roster. You're coming off 121 losses. You're coming off 121 losses. You can play a Rule 5 shortstop. For a couple oh, months. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe he's good. What do you have to lose? Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.